All right. So uh, for today, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to uh, do as promised. So we're going to moving from uh, uh, from learning the value of a policy to learning the optimal policy. So we're gonna do this in two steps. So for today, uh, we will be setting up the stage and we'll discuss in detail the case of K-armed bandits. Most of what we will discuss will be actually on the two-armed bandits. Uh, and then for tomorrow, we will just uh, introduce the general uh, uh, algorithm for uh, uh, state dependent situations. Uh, so ramping up uh, uh, from uh, uh, bandits to uh, uh, contextual bandits uh, uh, to the general MDP. Uh, uh, so that, that's the plan for, for today and tomorrow. And then on Friday, uh, we will have, as usual, uh, the tutorial, tutorial on this part, that is how to learn uh, to control optimally a system without a model. Okay, so we are, uh, you remember, we're always in the model free setting now. Okay, so let's uh, uh, briefly recap uh, what we had uh, from previous lectures. So uh, we focused on the question of uh, uh, how can we uh, learn given a certain policy pi, which is uh, chosen by the agent, uh, we aim uh, at uh, uh, computing uh, what is the value function, uh, which is, I remember you, the expectation uh, in this particular setting that we use, the expectation of the discounted sum of rewards, which we can write in this way, given that uh, the initial state is S, okay? So uh, once more, uh, in, the, in this expectation value, it's hidden the fact that this expectation is running over a sequence uh, of, so a string of data or a, a stream, as it's also called, uh, in which there is an initial state. Uh, uh, from that initial state, uh, sorry, an action, that, an action, Yeah, so, that, so an action A note is taken. And uh, this is according to our chosen policy. And as a result, uh, a reward is obtained and a new state is produced. And this is due to the uh, dynamics that is underlying our system, that is the transition probability, which is uh, as you remember, unknown to the to the agent. So the agent just observes this sequence of uh, states, uh, actions, new states, etc. Okay. So uh, the, these rewards that are uh, appearing here are produced in this uh, uh, sequential manner uh, by interacting with the environment. Uh, and uh, uh, what we uh, have been showing uh, in, in some detail is that uh, uh, it's possible to obtain a, 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 an algorithm uh, which just based on the sequential uh, reads of this uh, uh, stream uh, of observations, it's able to construct uh, this vector of values uh, v pi, approximations of this vector v that converge with probability one to the true value for a given policy. Okay, so and the way that it, this algorithm works is uh, in general, uh, so temporal difference learning. Uh, so the pseudocode for this is in general is uh, uh, just uh, initialize your estimate v node uh, with some vector. Okay, of course, the closest it is to the true value of a policy, the better it is. Uh, then at each time step, uh, 
what you basically do interactively is uh, 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 choose an action. Then, so this is a loop, so better yeah, loop here. Choose an action AT from the policy. Okay, so you observe uh, your state. Okay, so more precise, even more precisely, the loop starts here. Let's make it proper. The loop starts here. So the first thing is that you observe state S. So even better. Sorry for this. The loop starts here, and you initially observe your initial status node. Then you pick an action according to your policy. Uh, as a result, you observe uh, a reward and a new state. Okay. Uh, and then you uh, define the temporal difference error which is delta t plus one equals, sorry, maybe um, I can put that more comfortably in a, another row. The temporal difference error delta t plus one is defined as the observed reward uh, plus gamma. Your previous estimate at the newly observed state minus your previous estimate at the current state. And uh, uh, you remember that this temporal difference error can be interpreted as the difference between the observed reward and the estimated reward. So at any given time t, you can construct an estimation of what you expect to be the reward at the next step using your uh, current uh, approximation of the value function, and you compare it uh, with the actual observation. And this provides you with the temporal difference error, which you use to correct your previous estimate. Uh, then in general, uh, uh, you define uh, an eligibility vector. Okay. Uh, or you uh, update better. By some uh, by some algorithm, okay. So initially, you have defined some uh, also some eligibility e node. So you have you have, here you updated uh, et. You get your eligibility at time. Uh, let's say t. Okay, uh, by some rule. Okay, for instance, just to clarify the idea. E.g. Uh, e t of s is equal to just the indicator function of the state you have just deleted for for t denotes. Okay, so it's either you update it if you have memory, which is the case in t d lambda, or you just define it as the indicator function for the current state if you are t denote. Okay. Uh, so here you fill it in with your own favorite uh, choice of eligibility trace, which might be the ones that you saw in the tutorial, or there are many, many other choices that you can make. Okay. Um, and then uh, uh, this is the time to update your estimate. Okay, and the way you do it is just you, uh, your new estimate at any state S uh, is the previous estimate plus the learning rate, which might depend on time. And if you schedule it properly, it should. Uh, the temporal difference error and then the eligibility at that time. Okay, and this loop uh, ends uh, until 
termination condition. So this termination condition could be uh, uh, the error uh, between the difference between the previous estimate and the current estimate is below some tolerance uh, defined according to some norm or whatever you choose. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, this algorithm under the conditions uh, uh, under uh, Robbins Morrow conditions. Uh, which are, I recall you, that the sum of the squares, the series of the squares of the learning rates must converge in the series of the learning rates must diverge. And these conditions, we uh, have that uh, the uh, T estimate tends to the true v pi uh, as t goes to infinity. And the way it approaches it, so the convergence rate depends on the choice of the uh, uh, learning rates, okay? So he, the, uh, in a way that we, we don't discuss, but uh, it's, uh, it's, particular, it's not particularly uh, complex or, uh, or informative uh, at this stage. <clears throat> okay, so this is, uh, um, uh, in a nutshell, uh, what uh, the idea of temporal difference learning is. And uh, uh, today we would like to combine this with the notion of uh, optimization in order to uh, solve asymptotically the Bellman's equation in a, a, in a much similar spirit. So uh, just uh, relying on a sequence of uh, observations uh, that we obtain by interacting uh, with the environment, like this screen here. Uh, we would like to uh, update uh, our estimate of the value and concurrently update our policy. So change our policy uh, at the same time as we uh, learn the value of the current policy. Okay, so this is going to be uh, some sort of uh, uh, running on two different uh, rails and trying to keep up uh, uh, in, a, in a consistent way. Uh, but before we, we, we go there, um, Let's just uh, uh, let's just take a very very simple example uh, of how temporal difference learning uh, works. This is even simpler than the than the one uh, that you discussed uh, uh, at the tutorial. So this uh, this example serves two purposes. So the first purpose is just to uh, a little bit demystify all the. Uh, Temporal difference uh, setting, in the sense that making making it uh, extremely uh, transparent in a very very simple case. Um, uh, of course, this doesn't mean that uh, uh, temporal difference learning is a, is a trivial uh, uh, concept. It's a it's a concept which, however, connects very very clearly to some very very simple idea. Um, this this is the first purpose of this example. The second one is because we uh, refresh our ideas about uh, uh, bandits that we will be using uh, subsequently. So uh, the example uh, that we discuss here, uh, uh, what is the value of a policy for a K-armed bandit? So, uh, a K R bandit is a is a very simple object from the viewpoint of MDBs. Okay, um, so there is just one state, a single state. What what is it? This state for a K R bandit. Well, uh, a state for a K R bandit means uh, that we have K arms to choose with. Okay, so this is one, two, K. And each of these arms has some distribution of rewards. Okay. So, for instance, for arm one, the rewards might be just like this, distributed like this. So, this is the density, the probability density of reward for arm one. And similar, there could be different distributions for the, the arms. I'm drawing them explicitly in, in these weird ways to uh, convey the idea that. They could be anything, okay? 
So it's a totally uh, arbitrary distribution. Uh, we usually uh, put some conditions uh, of well-behavedness. So uh, when you have to study algorithms for bandits, you often find the requirement that uh, uh, this distribution be bounded in the sense that there is a minimal and a maximal reward or that they are sub-Gaussian, uh, which is a statement about the tails in case they are not bounded. So you will find uh, many, many times uh, this kind of assumptions. It's possible also to discuss bandits with uh, broader distributions like power low tails or whatever. So you you might be seeing many of this in the in the literature if you uh, happen to be uh, interested in this uh, in this uh, kind of problems. Uh, as well as there are many, many test beds which are much simpler like uh, Bernoulli bandits or Gaussian bandits. Okay, so they could be of any kind. You should, your lack of knowledge about the distribution could go from, uh, uh, I don't know anything except that it has some uh, nice uh, uh, boundedness property or uh, I could know that these are all Gaussians of the same variance, but I don't know the means, okay? So uh, all this defines one state. Okay, so the state here is uh, how we parameterize the distributions of the various arms. Okay, and once we have that state, uh, there are many actions that we can do. Okay, there are k of them, one, two, k actions, and uh, for each of these actions, uh, you inevitably get to the previous state, okay, so which means that these distributions don't change over time or don't change as a result of the decision I make, which uh, uh, means that uh, uh, in practice, uh, uh, we are dealing uh, with the specific situation which goes under the name of stochastic bandits. Okay. Uh, and in this process of getting back to the new state, you get, you get your reward which is picked from that, this particular distribution, okay? So if I pick it from uh, 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 action one, I go like this, this means that I'm picking it from this distribution here and so on for different decisions, okay? So uh, now we suppose that we fix the policy. What, what does that mean? It means, for instance, we might fix, to fix, just to fix the ideas, choose a random policy. So we pick actions at random at every step, we, we throw, uh, uh, we roll a dice uh, with K faces uh, and uh, we choose which action to take. Uh, and then we observe the reward that it gives. And then our question is, what is the value of this policy and how do I compute it according to temporal difference? Okay. So, <clears throat> so in this case, what we uh, come to observe uh, is, uh, not, not a sequence of states because the states are it's always the same. So it's absolutely irrelevant what we observe uh, at the level of states, but you, you just observe a sequence of, uh, so we pull an action, we pull an arm, uh, we get a reward, we pull another arm, we get the second reward and so on and so forth. Okay. So uh, yeah, here in, uh, uh, there is a slight, uh, um, um, misalignment between the notation for uh, MDPs and the notation for uh, uh, bandits. In that, uh, in uh, uh, usually in temporal difference, uh, you define the reward as uh, uh, R sub T plus one to convey the idea that it depends on uh, both the present state and the future state in general. Um, so the, at least this is a notation that uh, Sutton and Bartow use and, and promote. Um, for bandits, usually uh, you use another notation in the sense that if you pick an action A, you observe a reward which has the same time label as the action. So usually the stream here is defined as follows. Okay, so this might be a little source of confusion if you skip from one uh, uh, notation to the other, uh, but uh, just a little bit of reflection should uh, solve the issue, okay? Um, so this is also a disclaimer that if I mess up with the uh, notations, uh, I can blame someone else for that. Uh, so, um, 
Okay, and then you, you observe this and then uh, you want to uh, uh, obtain what is the value of this policy that is generating these actions. Right, so uh, now the value of a policy for uh, a stochastic bandit uh, is a very simple object because since there is one state, uh, uh, VPI uh, is a, a scalar. Okay, so it's just a real number. So we don't need to deal with the vector. And also, since there is a single state, uh, there is only one meaningful choice for the eligibility, which is just to give one. Okay, so eligibility. So you, you cannot give credit to other states because that's, that's just that state. And there's no reason to give credit to different credits at different times because all the processes are inherently uh, stationary. Okay. Uh, and then, as you may recall from, uh, uh, from our previous discussions, uh, uh, gamma does not play any role. The reason is that we, uh, at every time we pick an action independently from the past and we observe a reward independently from the past. So uh, when, we have, when we have a certain gamma, we basically, the only thing that changes is that we have a factor one over one minus gamma multiplying the overall value of the function. Okay. So you can see that from the, uh, Let me open uh, the parentheses here. Uh, you may remember that uh, uh, we have the uh, we have the um, uh, recursion relation, not that thing, please. Uh, we have a re recursion relation um, for the value, for the value of a policy. Yes, so this object that you've seen several times so far. Okay, so uh, for, for a bandit, remember, there is no state. So this is just a scalar. It drops all the uh, indices here drop out. Uh, this object here for a bandit is uh, uh, one, the indicator function of the state which remains the same. So this is your policy and your policy doesn't depend on the state. So we can just put pi of a. So uh, if I use this recursion relation, this just tells me that this is equal to sum over a pi a of the reward, which again depends only on the action, plus gamma v pi. So I'm just been rewriting the recursion relation for, for a bandit. And then now you realize that if you uh, open up this sum, this first term is just sum over pi a. Okay, these are the average rewards, remember? And then I get plus gamma. V pi doesn't depend on the action, it's just a number. So it uh, goes out of the sum. And here I have sum over the probabilities of the policy. But this thing here is equal to one because probability normalized to one. So uh, you see, I can uh, take this term uh, here and take it to the left hand side. And if I do that, I get that V pi is equal to one over one minus gamma sum over A pi. So you see that whatever gamma I choose, I always get the value which is proportional to the value with gamma equals zero. This is V pi for gamma equals zero. So it doesn't really matter to have gamma different from zero for bandits. And like I told you, it's just because you're basically repeating the same thing over and over again. There's no change. No, there's no notion of a future in practice, okay? So, uh, so far we can stick to uh, 
we can stick to gamma equals zero. It doesn't, doesn't make any, any difference. All these simplifications are particularly useful because they basically uh, break down temporal difference uh, to a very, very uh, simple uh, algorithm, uh, which uh, just does the following. So TD, again, TD, whatever, because uh, uh, it doesn't matter, uh, eligibility traces can only be one. So there's no difference between TD node, TD lambda, whatever. TD for bandits. Well, this just tells you that uh, your uh, estimate at subsequent time is the estimate each time. Now, these are scalars, just numbers, plus your uh, learning rate alpha t. And then you have your reward, which I now are using rt minus. So this is what the temporal difference error becomes uh, for bandits for gamma equals zero. It's just the difference between the reward and the current estimate. Okay. Okay. Now uh, we can further unpack this uh, recursion uh, to make it even more transparent to see what is happening here. And to do that, we consider two situations. So. Uh, the first case is uh, when the alpha t's are constant and all equal to each other. Okay. So we know that this is not a good choice because this is not going to give us convergence to the true value function because, it, I mean, at least, okay, let me state it more precisely. The conditions, the sufficient conditions are not verified, so we cannot rely on Robinson Morrow result in order to prove that this converges to the actual value function. Okay, which is a more precise statement. Right. Actually, the only precise statement. Okay, so let's consider this situation. Uh, uh, so let's just do this very, uh, very pedantic way. So let's start with the guess and say that uh, we choose zero for our initial value or just, just this is just meant to simplify the calculations. But you could choose any value, okay? In fact, you don't know what, what is the distribution of your rewards. So it, it could be anywhere. It could be in the 1,000s, and it could be in the minus 1,000s, it could be around zero, whatever. You don't know. Uh, so you start with uh, your zero guess, uh, and then you, at the first step, okay, remember that you have your stream. You pick uh, an action A note, and this, as a result, gave you uh, a reward. Uh, uh, are not, and then uh, uh, what you do is uh, you update according to this rule with alpha constant, and then you say, okay, this is going to be the reward of my step zero uh, minus the v of step zero. But these objects are uh, both of them are zero, so at my first step, I just get alpha times the reward that I just measured. Okay, so far so good, and then I do go to the second step. And the second step tells me that I have to do B1 plus alpha, the new reward minus the value of one. And then I have just to plug in this expression from the previous time. And this becomes alpha one node plus alpha. R1 minus alpha one node, which I can expand to see that it becomes alpha r1 plus alpha 1 minus alpha r0. Let's do another one just for the sake of being explicit. But you, you start seeing the pattern, I hope. Uh, and then uh, it means that I have to use v2 here. And use V2 explicitly there, which will lead me to and I let's let's rewrite this in another way, which makes it even more transparent, I think. Uh, so I collected the the estimate V2 in the previous line. Okay, I extracted this one here and then I collected that. 
And then if I plug that in, what do I get? Well, I get alpha R2 plus alpha one minus alpha R1 plus alpha one minus alpha squared R0. Okay. And then uh, you can proceed inductively or uh, you can uh, just uh, jump ahead and say that uh, uh, after T steps, your estimate uh, will be like this. This is going to be the sum T prime from zero to T of one minus alpha to the power T, it's T prime. Okay, and you can check that this uh, is indeed what is uh, happening, or you can take this expression and plug it back into the recursion here into this definition of temporal difference and check that it's it uh, everything uh, adds up properly. Okay, so. Uh, what is temporal difference doing here with fixed alpha? Well, uh, it's just taking uh, uh, an exponentially weighted, geometrically weighted average, and it's weighted with recency. Okay, recent stuff has a larger weight. Okay, so if you look at this expression here backwards, you see that uh, your estimate at step three is alpha, your learning rate, times what you just got at time before. And then you get alpha times one minus alpha from what happened at two steps before. And then alpha times one minus alpha squared is what happened three steps before. Okay, and this, this is what is expressed here. So this is uh, some sort of uh, fading memory, okay? It's a geometrically fading memory. So if you have your sequence of steps from zero, one to T, and you have collected rewards, which I can put as a sort of a points here. So this is my reward zero, my reward one, etc. So I get my reward T. That's alpha so I reward T minus one, just for simplicity. Okay, so what this object is computing is that it is computing some uh, uh, weighted average of this object, which is weighted uh, with some uh, geometrically or exponentially, if you wish, decreasing kernel. So this object here, is uh, this one minus alpha to the t minus t prime. So, and you can see uh, how these two extremes uh, come to happen. Uh, so uh, if alpha, so for instance, if alpha get, gets exactly equal to one, what is happening here? Well, your kernel is extremely short. It just cares about the current moment. In this case, your estimate will just be your instantaneous reward, okay? So it relaxes immediately to what you just observed, which is a good idea if there is no noise, but a very bad idea if there's noise. In general, there is noise. And also uh, in a multi arm bandit, the reward that you take depends on the action that you just took. So, uh, it has no memory whatsoever of all the other actions that you do. So alpha tending to one is not a good idea, okay? It has its merits to get a large alpha because it, you converge rapidly to your value function, okay? Because this gives you the rate of convergence of the sum. Uh, all these many terms, if uh, alpha is big, one minus alpha is small, and this sum tends to converge quickly to its uh, average. But there's a bar, of course, uh, you are, you have a lot of variance because these things may fluctuate. So you may want to see what happens when you go in the limit of alpha tending to zero. When alpha tends to zero, uh, the good news is that uh, you average a lot because you sum all these terms more or less in the same way. 
but you have to wait a lot before your uh, curve eventually approaches uh, uh, your current value. Okay, so in in a nutshell, what temporal difference uh, with constant alpha is doing in this very simple setting, it's just it's computing a running average of the rewards. So as they come, you have this running average with some uh, uh, exponentially fading memory uh, in the past, and then you just keep on keeping track of this. So as such, it stays around the mean. You can actually prove that the average value of these estimates is the true function, uh, which is a nice exercise. Uh, exercise. Prove that the expectation of Vt is V pi. So if you average over many, many histories of uh, actions and rewards, this is exactly V pi. The key observation is that everything here is linear. So when you average, it's very, it's very simple. Uh, but you also can see that in this case, uh, you can prove uh, that the variance of Vt stays finite. This is the drawback of having the constant alpha. And you can check how does it depend on alpha. So in intuition is that as alpha goes to zero, the variance should go down. But you will also realize how long it takes to get there. Okay. Very good. Um, now, second situation, uh, which is also of interest. Let's say that we take uh, alpha t equals one over t plus one. This is a choice which uh, uh, resembles uh, the situation for uh, Robbins Morrow conditions, only that strictly speaking, this is outside Robbins Morrow uh, because uh, uh, it's just exactly on the border and the border is not is not good enough. Okay. Yeah, I guess so. It's a situation in which your uh, sum over alpha t diverges. No, sorry, it's it's inside. Sorry, it's just in the border, but it's inside. Okay, very good. So, what does it mean to perform uh, temporal difference learning uh, with this uh, choice? Uh, let's rewrite once more the. Uh, formula, and this would become 1 over t plus 1. Is this expression any familiar to any of you? No? Doesn't ring a bell. Okay, so if it doesn't, maybe uh, what it what would be is that it, let's let's repeat the exercise that we did uh, just a second before. Now let's start with the we know it equals zero. Then we have our first choice, which uh, we tell you that uh, I have to put t equals zero. Then so this is r zero. Okay, so here I'm just replacing V note here and here to zero. Uh, and then I'm taking R zero divided by T plus one, but T is zero here. Okay, so this is T equals zero. Okay, do you agree with that? Fine, then let's go to T equals one, which gives me my estimate V2, which is V1 plus one over two, R2 minus V1. All right, so this is R naught plus one half. Sorry, why did I put R2? Because this is where I promised that there will be confusion and confusion it is. Uh, V1 two, so this must be R1, yeah. It is R1 minus R0, but this is R0 plus R1 
divided by two. Should I go on? Can you guess what this will be? Anyone wants to try? So if I had one sample, I had this. If I had two samples, I got this. If I have T samples. It's like the average. Yeah, the empirical mean. This object is nothing but the empirical mean. It's the sum of the rewards from time zero to time T minus one R T. All right, sorry. One over T. And in fact, this object here is nothing but the recursive way of computing a, a sample mean. Okay, so you, I'm, I'm pretty sure you have used this in the past. When you compute a mean of data which come one after the other, okay, you don't wait to collect all the data and then you sum and then you divide, but you do it online. As, the, as data come, you correct your current uh, sum by this, okay? Which is again, another way of interpreting at a very broad and if you wish superficial level, what temporal difference is doing. It's trying to compute an estimate in which case this turns out to be exactly the same for me. Okay, so you could do that by using a, a memory which fades out very slowly in time, like one over T, or you could do it with a memory which fades out geometrically in time, like this in this case. Okay, if you do it like this, you are guaranteed to converge to the mean. Why is that? Well, just by the law of large numbers the variance will be killed like one over the number of samples if you do it like this, okay? Which is another way to understand what the hell is going on with temporal difference methods in this very simple setting. Of course, generalizing from this to the full temporal difference problem, it's not obvious, okay? So that's why I put the general framework before and the example after. Okay, so you see just that this is one specific instance of, of a problem. All right, very good. Um, so now that we have, uh, I, I hope, come to the process of demystifying uh, uh, what the uh, general idea of temporal difference learning is, and nonetheless understanding that it's connected with very powerful ideas uh, like, like stochastic approximation, which in itself is connected with the stochastic gradient descent, okay? So uh, whenever now you encounter in your different excursions in uh, uh, machine learning, uh, the notion of stochastic gradient descent, just be reminded that there is a, a continuous path bringing you from uh, the simple notion of how to compute a sample mean to gradient descent. And these are the steps that connect the dots, okay? Uh, now, uh, we, we are ready now really ready to start for the uh, the real endeavor, that is uh, how to couple this kind of reasonings uh, with the uh, uh, optimization. And we will do that for bandits, but for do doing that, we will just need to uh, enlarge a little bit uh, what we've been doing so far. So add a little bit of uh, a new angle on this, and then we are ready to go. But for that, I suggest that we start uh, uh, after the break. Uh, which could be, say, 5 plus 10. Okay? See you later. All right. So uh, the last ingredient that we need in order to set up the stage in full for, um, for tackling the problem of uh, finding the optimal policy, uh, at least for bandits today, um, is to uh, uh, recall that uh, we've been working so far mostly with an object which is the value function of a state, but there is another uh, important uh, quantity which is the uh, value function of a state action pair. So, uh, 
and uh, it shouldn't come too much of a surprise for you to know that uh, you can uh, learn uh, the state action value function. as well uh, by the same technique. So just a, a quick reminder to what the, this uh, uh, object uh, uh, I'm talking about is. Uh, so we introduced it, uh, the quality or state action value function of a pair of states and actions is uh, just the expected cumulative uh, uh, return and then you know, already regarding to the general notation, starting from a certain state and a certain action. Okay, so there's a double condition in here over the initial states and the action that is taken. Um, this uh, object is, uh, uh, in fact, uh, by unrolling this uh, uh, sum here and extracting the first term and considering all the rest that happens afterward, it's easy to derive uh, uh, the following relationship. Uh, between uh, uh, the state action value and the state value function. Okay, that's uh, how the two things are connected. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, quite uh, straightforward. It just tells you that uh, if you start from a state uh, in uh, S and pick an action A, then this will send you with probability small p to a new state S prime here. Uh, and as a result of this state action and new state, you will collect an average reward of small r. And from that point on, it will send you for a new state S prime. And therefore, what you gather from that point on is just the value function, OK? So you have split the contribution of the action that you took at the, uh, the initial time from what uh, what else is happening in, uh, in the future. OK, any question? Uh, there's also a converse uh, relationship, uh, which is uh, also straightforward, is that uh, the value function at a certain state, well, this is just uh, the average over the actions that you choose of the state action value. Okay, so this is again mapping the same language. So these two equations together clearly tell you that uh, the value function and the Q function are totally equivalent. And okay? you can trade one for the other. The advantage of uh, the value function is that it's more compact. It's just uh, a vector. And the advantage of the Q function uh, becomes more apparent when one discusses uh, things like the Bellman equation, okay? So I will make it sure clear in a second. Um, so just to complete the, 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 the full uh, picture and see the two things uh, at work, uh, one beside the other, uh, the first thing that one has to realize is that if we combine these two equations together and we replace uh, uh, the value function here for its explicit expression, which is present here, then uh, we uh, can write the following uh, relationship. Okay, so I just replaced this last expression for the value function here. So this is a closed linear expression for Q. Okay, uh, which uh, can be used for temporal difference learning pretty much as we use the recursion relation for V for temporal difference learning. Okay, so this is the uh, first uh, the first message. Uh, and we will do that in a second. Uh, 
But uh, uh, let me just stress that there also is a Bellman's optimality equation for Q. Which reads Q star. So for the optimal policy, this is going to be the first prime. And the first part stays the same as always, plus gamma. But now we have the maximum appearing here. And this also tells me that the optimal policy from state S is to pick the maximum of my two star matrix. Okay. So this is the equivalent of the Bellman's equation and how we derive an optimal policy from the solution of the Bellman's equation. And this is where the merit of the use of the state action value function Q becomes apparent because this just tells you that if you know the uh, uh, Q star matrix, uh, it's enough to look at all the columns. So for each row, which is labeled by S, okay? So let's say we draw the Q star as a matrix in which there are states here and actions here. Okay, so all the columns are given by the actions and all the rows are given by the states. Then if you, fix, if you fix on one particular row and you select the column which has the largest entry, this will select the best action. Okay, this is what this a formal expression above for the optimal policy means. You just by looking at this table, you just realize for each state, that is for each row, what the best action is. You just have to take the entry with the largest value of Q star. So the connection between optimal action and uh, value function is much more straightforward for Q at the price that you have to deal with a matrix rather than with a vector. Okay, so there are advantages and disadvantages. Yeah. But other than that, the two formalisms are exactly equivalent. Okay, there is no uh, shade, shady, shaded area uh, in which one thing doesn't give anything consistent with the other. In particular, uh, you can also connect this with the optimal state through this relationship. So in this entry here, this entry here is actually he is also the star of S. So there's a there's a perfectly matching dictionary. But uh, uh, we will come back to this later on. Uh, now for the moment, we just uh, I just want to uh, stress that uh, given this uh, relation re uh, recursion relationship here, you can derive uh, a temporal difference learning. for state action values, okay? So given a policy, how do I learn what is the Q matrix for that policy? Uh, well, it works pretty much like it worked uh, for the value function. So there are some things that we already did. We have to move uh, this left-hand side to the right-hand side and turn uh, this expectation into a stochastic object, okay? So we do not repeat all the steps because we've been doing that too far, but uh, too many times. But uh, I will just give you uh, the bottom line, uh, which is that uh, you can update uh, your Q function at each step in a, according to a rule which is uh, very resemblant of the one for the value function, only that there are two important changes.
Okay, so the two important changes are that your uh, temporal difference error here has a different form in the sense that it's uh, constructed starting from your uh, uh, Q matrix values, of course, because that's the ones that you have at hand here. Uh, it's not the only choice, but it's uh, the most straightforward one. Uh, and then the second thing is that your eligibility traces, uh, now you have to give credit not only to states, but also to actions. Okay, so this is my eligibility. Sorry, you're missing a T in the top right. The I'm two. missing a T, yes, thank you. So uh, from your stream of states, actions, and rewards, now you can construct this temporal difference error, noticing that you have to go one step further here uh, with the action at time t plus one in order to construct this particular temporal difference error. And then you can use this to learn uh, how, to, how to proceed, okay? So, uh, Let's, let's go back to our example again with bandits. So uh, with bandits, now we uh, have a Q function of pi, which depends on the actions. So if you have two arms, this will be a vector with two entries. If you have K arms, it will be a vector with K entries. So how does temporal difference for Q work like, okay? So this is a PD node, okay? So how does it look like? Well, uh, let's do that explicitly. Uh, my new estimate for every A is my previous one plus my learning rate, step T. And then here I can use uh, gamma equals zero so I can get rid of this middle term here. Uh, and I just can say that this is just my reward, where again, there is this t plus one, t minus one, uh, t plus one t uh, ambiguity uh, in the notation, but this is essentially what we get. And this again has to be multiplied times one if I pick the action small a at time t, okay? So here, here is where there is this uh, uh, slight difference between what we've been doing so far, uh, because what is happening now is that uh, uh, we update only the entry of our vector, which has just been chosen. Okay. All the other entries, we leave them as they, were, as they are, because this indicator function tells me, you got a reward and uh, the action which is to reward, so sorry, to give credit to or to blame for this result is the action that you just took, okay? Makes sense. But if this is a result, you know that this means that uh, while you're working out your strategy, you will have to keep uh, multiple records, one for each entry of your vector, and you will be updating them uh, asynchronously, okay? So every time that you pick an action, you update that, and all the rest stays the same and so on and so forth. So it will not come as a surprise that uh, uh, if you do the same kind of calculation that we did for the value function, but now for this situation, the formula turned out to be very similar, except that now you don't count uh, time t, but you count the number of times that you have done that particular action, okay? So it's uh, easier written than said. Uh, when you use, for instance, uh, uh, your uh, alpha constant, uh, this will tell you that uh, uh, after t steps, if I'm not mistaken with the, again with the notation of perhaps the after t plus one steps. Uh, your estimate will be like, so supposing that you start uh, with your initial guess always at zero, uh, your final result will be that you have to sum over all t prime 
from zero to t, and then you, you will have your alpha here, your one minus alpha here. But here, you remember we had the, the final time minus the current time in our expression uh, here, okay? You see, we had this exponent here. Now we have to replace this by the number of times that we have visited the detection minus the number of times we visited the detection at the previous time, okay? So that's the only change that we have to make. So basically times just flows by the number of times that I'm visiting. So every, every arm has its own clock, if you wish, which measures the number of times that I've been doing that action. So this is not expressing just the depth, that depth. You can work out the algebra, it's rather boring, not particularly informative, but uh, the, the bottom line is that. And here you have your little Okay, doesn't matter. The intuition is always the same. You have different records for each arm. Okay, this n of t is the number of visits up to time t. So n of t is the sum uh, of, say, uh, i going from zero to t. I hope I'm not messing up uh, with the indices, but uh, please check. Uh, if what I'm writing is correct, AI is equal to A. Okay, so this is the, just the counts. This, it's a random variable which counts the number of times that you've been doing that action small A. Fine, whatever. This is just to tell you that uh, the same things apply, only you have to, to do this in parallel in different records. And um, uh, also you could define uh, uh, something which is slightly different, for instance, uh, uh, so this is the first situation. You could also use uh, uh, adaptive uh, learning rates. Adaptive is in very, very limited sense here. So suppose you define your rate now dependent on the arm. So every arm learns at a different rate. And this rate is now one over the number of times that you visit the, the arm so far plus one. Okay. So you have, for every clock, you have count the number of, sorry, for every arm, you count the number of times that you visited it. And, and you learn with a rate which depends on the number of times that you visited. It. And if you do that, you can do the simple exercise. You will see that uh, your estimate QT is the sample average of rewards is that QT of A of rewards for arm A. Okay, so there is a parallelism here. If you do things carefully, you can map these things into sample averages as well. All right. So uh, now we are more or less equipped with, with everything we want to, to proceed. So let's, let's try to face the problem now of coupling all this machinery with trying to find the optimal policy for bandits. Okay. So uh, what is the general idea that we have to deal with? Uh, so the framework that we have in mind is the following. So, Remember that uh, if we have some policy, uh, this policy can produce uh, actions. And from these actions, we observe uh, in general uh, uh, rewards and possibly also new states, okay? Uh, which lead us uh, to uh, an estimate of my Q, okay? So this is the sort of the flow that uh, uh, temporal difference learning proposes. You have a policy, produce an action, observe reward, update your queue, and then you start over again, okay? You do one of these steps, you update your queue, and then you start over again, and then you start over again, always picking action according to your policy pi. The general idea that we want to explore now is that we want to close this loop. So, 
What is the idea? Uh, at every time step, you will have a policy in your hands. Okay, so we're gonna make this in time. So like uh, uh, from, from a certain policy pi at a certain time, we produce an action. We will observe a new state and the reward. We will use them to update our Q function. And we use this new update in order to produce a new policy. Okay, so we use our current information about the value function which we have at end in order to improve the policy. Okay, so remember this is what happens in the Bellman's equation. In short, you have a Q function, and from that Q function you derive a policy. This is also very resemblant to what we did with policy iteration. We had a policy, computed its value, and used it to improve the policy, and then computed the new value. Okay, so the idea is always this idea of cycling over ex using experience, cycling, and improving. Okay. So, uh, what is the uh, a simple idea. For instance, we might say that uh, if we have a certain estimate Q at time T, uh, we may decide that you, we can pick our policy at time T as the argmax of Q at time T, okay? So just Again, now I fall back to the bandits situation. Uh, my policy would be uh, the, the one when I pick the argument of argmax over. So I, I have one vector, which is my current estimates of what the qualities of each arm are. And I pick the one which has the largest Q. Okay, so once more. Uh, so think, think about this situation. Uh, I am using some policy and I'm producing some samples for each of the options that I have. Say you have two arms. So I pull that and I get a number and then I pull that and I get a num number and I go on and so forth. And I construct something which looks like the sample average of the two arms. And then at each step, based on uh, which one, looks better from the viewpoint of the sample average, I will stick to that, okay? This is clearly dangerous, okay? The scope, the goal of this part is just to show you how bad this choice is, okay? So a simple idea, but too naive. So where does it where does this idea come from? Well, it does it just comes from from the Bellman's equation. Okay, that's what the Bellman's equation tells you. Uh, if you have your Q star, sorry, I'm going to, uh, yeah. If you have your Q star, then you have your optimal policy just by picking the maximum. But the point is that can you trust your current approximation? Is it accurate enough? Okay, so uh, this is what you would do according to a so-called uh, greedy choice. So how do we show that this is not what uh, a good option would be? Let's consider the situation uh, uh, with K equals two. It's a two arm bandit. Okay. And let's assume that the rewards uh, are positive, just uh, there's no specific uh, need to do that. It's just for the, what I will be showing in, in the following, just uh, graphically requires the, that the rewards are positive. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, since there are just two arms, uh, I can graphically depict my Q vectors vector in this on this axis okay so this is component q1 and this is component q2 
And let's assume that uh, my, my, the true values, okay, remember here we are not Bayesian. There, there really are true values for the, uh, uh, for the, the bandits, the true averages uh, are somewhere here, let's say. So this is, this is the average reward for arm one and the average reward for arm two. Whatever distribution they are, they have, okay? So they, they might be two Gaussians, they might be whatever, their means are there. And of course, uh, we want to construct approximations of our Q that get better, and but most importantly, they lead us to choose always the best one. And which is the best one in this case? So the best choice is arm one, okay? Because everything that, stand, that stays uh, uh, below the diagonal means that the arm one is better than the arm two. Okay, so let's see how our greedy algorithm, what it does in practice, okay? Uh, it, it starts from somewhere. So the first thing that we have to do, we have to pick up some value to start with, okay? Uh, let's just for uh, the sake of, uh, just to clarify things, let's start uh, with one choice and we will do many of those. So let's say we start here. So this is a choice which looks like already very well informed, okay? It's just like someone is uh, whispering at your ear saying, listen, R1 is much better than the other one, okay? Okay, fair enough. Let's say it's a possibility. Maybe we are just being lucky and we've been starting from a good choice, okay? We will explore many of those, okay? This is just one to start with. So uh, if you start with that choice, uh, the first step, you just are greedy and what do you do? You play arm one, right? And if you play arm one, you will update Q one. So you will make a step in this direction. Expectedly so, because it depends on the variance of your uh, rewards in uh, of the first arm, okay? So, and then you just may move around and so on and so forth. But eventually you expect to be converging here. Notice that you never pick the action two here, never. There's no reason whatsoever to pick it. So you will keep on playing action one and you will converge to some point which is uh, close to, to mu one. So you will learn, of course, you will learn the value of arm one, which is your best arm. So good. As a matter of fact, in this case, you're playing optimally all the time because you've been playing the best arm since the beginning. So no problem whatsoever. Now, let's see what happens if you play uh, starting from another choice. So for instance, now you, okay, now let's, let's do the first stuff and Let's say what we've been doing uh, until now. So let's start uh, with zero, okay? Uh, and since uh, we start with zero, now we are totally indifferent. There's no preference. Both entries of my Q, of my Q vector are the same. So I could choose one or the other. So let's say by chance I, I choose Q2, okay? Uh, if I choose Q2, well, my, my mu2 here is much above. So, uh, so reasonably speaking, uh, uh, this will go up. And I find myself in the uppermost part of the graph, okay? Uh, what do I choose now? Well, I choose action two because I'm in the upper part of the graph. And so I will go on and play action two all the time. My estimate for action one, which is and could have been way better than action two, 
is staying at zero just because I don't visit them, right? So I go here, I learn perfectly well what is happening for ARM2, but the fact is that I don't get any money at all here. I'm losing money, okay? So I'm collecting information about the wrong thing. So we could start from some other place, okay? Uh, for instance, let's suppose we start up here. Sorry, this is not a good place. Let me put it even better. For reason management, let's be clear in a second. Let's suppose we start up here. Okay, now also the situation seems to be uh, somewhat uh, dangerous uh, because we are in the upper left part. Uh, but when we start doing things here, uh, the nice thing that happens is that uh, my estimate goes down. I'm playing arm two, and then I cross this boundary, okay? And then when I cross this boundary, I, I start playing arm one, which allows me to converge here. And in this case, now they, then I get stuck into the group. So you see that the bias, so the, the value from which you start becomes very important. So all these are sketches uh, which are admittedly very bad. The real situation when the viruses are large are uh, richer than this, of course, but this gives you the idea. If you are greedy, the initial bias can kill you. Okay. So in, in fact, the, there is a full picture for this, uh, which uh, you can uh, uh, verify independently. Uh, there is a whole region uh, of points uh, uh, which is uh, depicted here in uh, uh, dark orange. Including the axis. So all these choices here So if you start anywhere inside this uh, orange area, you, you stay stuck and you never be able to reach the optimal decision. That is to choose R1. All the other points manage by one way or another. In doing so, they give up getting information about R2 at some point. So that they sort of all converge to the, uh, so all other points converge to this, uh, to the axis uh, here, somewhere along this axis, at different levels, depending on where they started from, okay? Uh, none of those necessarily gets the right value for uh, arm two, but it doesn't really matter because they perform all of them. But of course, this is not what we want. This is extremely bad as a decision-making uh, process because we want to get uh, to do the right decision with high probability. Eventually, we would like to do that all the time. So is this possible? Can we, there are many questions that arise. Can we devise an algorithm that uh, does that uh, in a finite time. So after, can I construct an algorithm that tells me that after a certain number of steps, I will be playing the best action with probability one? Is it possible? Spoiler, no. Is it possible to have something slightly less than this? So is it possible to have something that approaches asymptotically decision making so that the probability of picking the wrong arm goes down to zero? with time, yes. And how fast? So how fast can I approach my optimal behavior? Okay. All these questions are answered mathematically by the theory of multi bandits. So there is not, there's just, there are books about it, okay? So we, we have no hope whatsoever of being able to cover a large part of that. But what I want to give you today is that first, give you a first hint of, about how to fix this problem. 
which is very general and applies also to the more complex setting of reinforcement learning, so including states. First, second, uh, um, I would also try to give you an idea of what are the limits. So what is not possible and what is possible and what are the limits given essentially by statistics on performance on decision making. Okay, these are the two things that I would like to give you in, uh, in the next 15 minutes. Okay, so uh, a better idea. So what was the problem here? Let's discuss it in a in a very uh, uh, in a very informal way. Uh, so the problem is uh, that uh, we are working in the wrong mindset, right? So uh, let's uh, try and think about a, a true decision-making problem. Like uh, uh, there is a teacher and this teacher has to decide whether a student is uh, uh, a good student uh, or a bad student. And then uh, uh, this uh, uh, teacher uh, gives some assignment, then receives the assignment and then uh, it has to make the decision whether to fail the student or not. And this clearly is a one-shot problem in which the teacher is in a very bad situation because there might be very, very various reasons for bad performance, right? So the, that particular day, the student might, might feel bad, might have a problem, might just, uh, it just was the only question that he didn't look carefully into, okay? So there are many sources of error. So a better strategy is let's repeat these things many times. So let's not just give one assignment, let's give 10 assignments. And then after that, we can make a more careful evaluation, okay? But it's also true that you want to, don't want to give 1000 assignments before deciding, okay? So up, as time goes by, you make your own idea about the student. Okay? So this, very simple idea means that one has to balance the need for exploitation that is based on the current knowledge. How much can I make a decision? And the quicker I make it, the better it is, of course. But at the same time, I don't want to kill exploration. That is, I have to allow for the possibility that since there is randomness in the world, things might happen just out of bad luck and not because there is a causal relationship. In a world which is perfectly deterministic, once you see an outcome, that's it. If you repeat the experiment, it will again give you that outcome if the world is deterministic. But if there is randomness, that's not the case, okay? So you, we have to confront with statistics, with uncertainty. So good news for you students, because uh, I will try to explore as much as is needed, okay? So, uh, but how to do it, okay? A better idea is just to mix in some exploration to the previous idea. Mix in. Not, not, not more, but just some, because there is no input. It's in some exploration. How to do that? Well, one simple recipe, for instance, would be, uh, let's define some uh, small parameter epsilon comprised between zero and one which we're gonna call our exploration rate. And let's say that uh, our policy now is uh, at every time uh, is the arg max of my estimate QT with probability one minus epsilon. Okay, almost always in a sense, okay. almost means depends on how small epsilon is. Uh, I will pick the, what my current knowledge suggests. Uh, but from time to time, according to this epsilon, 
I will pick any action at random. Okay. So if I repeat my, my experiment here, uh, let's start in a, in a situation where we were stuck, for instance, right? So I'm gonna draw this in red. Uh, so we, we were supposedly stuck here, but then there is this small epsilon. So again, at the beginning, suppose epsilon is, uh, I don't know, one over 1,000, okay? So roughly speaking, for the first 1,000 steps, I will be repeating what I always do, okay? So I will be playing only on two, and then, then I get stuck here. But then sometime I start playing action one. And therefore this will cause me to very slowly crawl in this direction until I cross this magic uh, point here and I start playing action one and then this finally accelerates and gets here. So this little noise that I'm putting into this walk in my few space is enough to let me cross this point, okay? So we're done, are we? Not quite. So what is the problem here? So one, good. Uh, we are not stuck any longer. The bad news is that we keep on exploring, okay? So we will still do once every 1,000 steps the bad thing. And cumulatively on the very long run, this is gonna cost us. So again, here you see there is another tension, okay? So that this is still too much exploration. So what we would like to do, in fact, is the following. Uh, we would like to explore more when we don't know things and less when we know a lot. So one way out would be, for instance, let's explore more at the beginning and less at the end, or let's explore more when we have been sampling this action poorly and explore less when we have been sampling this action a lot. So we have to find out a way to balance these two things. Okay, an even better idea. Let's schedule the exploration rate. Okay, so let's decide how to change the exploration with time. So for instance, at the beginning, we can set epsilon one at the very step, very first step. What does it give tells us? Well, if we set epsilon equals one, we just take actions at random, no matter what the, our queue is. So it's a way of ignoring the bias, if you wish, and moving more randomly. So at the first step, if epsilon is very large, there is no such thing as staying in place. You just start moving around. And if the learning rate is also large, you will make large steps. So if you combine large learning rates and large exploration, your point here is basically moving around randomly. So you explore a lot. But as time goes by, you would like to, one, make a smaller steps, which means alpha going to zero. Second, explore less because you will be focusing more and more when you're close to the target and you don't want to wiggle around, okay? Fine, we know how to schedule the learning rate, but how do we schedule the exploration rate? So what is a good choice for decreasing epsilon in time in order to find the, the best? choice. Okay. Uh, so 
here things become extremely uh, interesting. Uh, and there will be a lot of math, maths to, to do in order to prove the statements that uh, I'm going to give you. So we are not going to do that. I will just summarize the results and give you some insight on what the problem uh, uh, is and, and how to sort of uh, uh, get a qualitative understanding, semi-quantitative understanding of what is going on. So, uh, so the key idea here is the following. Suppose that in our two arms bandit, okay, so we have uh, a true value mu one and a true value mu two here, okay, and these things here is called the gap. That. Uh, after a certain number of trials, uh, suppose that uh, I have played uh, this action mu one many times, so I have uh, uh, a distribution of uh, values for my possible Q1, okay? So if I repeat these experiments many, many times uh, under a certain choice of the policy, it doesn't matter, under any policy, which is, uh, uh, I don't know, under epsilon greedy, okay? Sorry, I forgot to tell you that uh, this is this, uh, this quantity here. This is called an epsilon greedy choice, okay? Because it's greedy, but with exceptions, times upside. Uh, it doesn't need upside for this. Okay. So as a result, I've, I'm applying my epsilon greedy. I, I can I play many times the the action Q1, uh, and I play because my algorithm is working properly, uh, I'm gonna play the second arm much less than the first arm because it's suboptimal, which means that I will have a distribution which is uh, much broader, okay? Because the variance of the Q is uh, just goes like one over the number of times that I played that arm. This is the variance of arm A goes like one over the number of this, just like the variance of arm A. This is the variance of the rewards. And sorry, this is the variance of the rewards. And this is the number of times that I visited that arm. If I make many visits, I will have little uncertainty. If I make a small number of visits, I will have larger uncertainty, okay? So, the dangerous events are the events that are here in the tail of this distribution for Q2. So those times where after this number of times that you have visited the say N1, N2, is the, these are the number of visits to arm one and two or the number of times that you've chosen them. So, this tail here is the dangerous one. So what is the probability of being there? So the, what is the probability that uh, Q2 is actually larger than U1? Because this is the situation where uh, you would be wrong according to the greedy strategy. And this, this is the one that you want to kill. Uh, well, this goes, I mean, for Gaussians, for Gaussian distributions, this goes like exponential of minus the number of times that I played on two times the gap squared divided by two sigma squared. So it goes down exponentially with the number of times that you visit that R. So in order to kill this probability, To kill this, you want to have n2 large. But to win, you want to have n2 small. So there must be some sweet spot in there in which you balance these two things. Where is this sweet spot? Well, when you take, uh, un when you keep under control this. Uh, green tail of the distribution, but not too much. You don't want to make this distribution Q2 
very, very narrow because you don't care. Okay. So this is one very important uh, conceptual thing uh, to bear in mind in decision making. Uh, information is not the goal. Okay. The goal is to gain rewards. Let me do a very, very simple example. Suppose I tell you, you have option A, and under option A, you win zero or you win one with certain probabilities. And then I give you option B. In, under option B, you gain zero or something which could be anywhere between zero and minus one million. Okay? So what do you choose? Action, option A, right? But option A is characterized only by one bit of information. Whereas option B has an enormous amount of information. If the variables are continuous, it does, does strictly speaking infinite information there. But you don't care because this information has no value for you. Okay. So information is necessary, but only the bits of information that are important. Notice that information theory itself does not have in itself this notion of how much a bit is worth. Every bit is a bit. Okay. So decision-making and information theory have a boundary, but one has to be very, very careful about what that is. So maximizing information in decision-making might be a very bad choice. So you don't have to be curious, too curious about bad things. When they are statistically reasonably bad, okay? So that's where all the sub subtlety is. You need to collect information in order to be statistically confident that that option is bad. And once it's bad, you don't have to be curious any more than this. Okay, that's where the sweet spot between exploration and exploitation is. I'm talking like a guru, new age guru, so I better stop here and go back to the math, okay? And the math tells you that this sweet spot is located when this N2 goes logarithmically with time, okay? So this requires some, uh, some elaborate math, but uh, it's clear that N2 must grow. So the number of times that you visit some suboptimal R must grow in time, because if you stop visiting, then there still is a small probability that things can be different from what you observe, even if it's exponentially small. So N2 must grow, but it must not grow too fast. And it turns out that the sweet spot is to make it grow logarithmically in time. And the precise statement for this is actually uh, called the uh, uh, Lie Robbins bound, which I don't remember for, from which time it is, but I think it's in uh, 85. Okay, I have it here. 1985. Okay, so we quite. quite uh, Comparatively recent with respect to the, uh, the the age of the problem of uh, multi arm bandits, uh, the Lyrobis mount tells the following: that uh, uh, the uh, expected number of times that you play an arm A, if A is uh, belongs to the suboptimal. Choices. Okay, so you have a K arm bandit and you pick an arm A, which is uh, uh, suboptimal. This is the number of times that you played that arm up to time P, and this is the expectation. And you divide this by the logarithm of the number of times that you played, say T here, and you take the limit for t going to infinity. This quantity here must be above 
one over the kullback libel divergence between the distribution of the arm of the suboptimal arm and the distribution of the optimal arm. So this is, remember the uh, PDF of rewards for arm A. And this is uh, for arm, for the best arm. So there's a lot here to unpack. So this is an asymptotic statement, okay? This is, this condition must be met for any policy such that the policy by T asymptotically gets the arc max of the true values. So for any policy that asymptotically chooses the best arm with probability one, that is a, a good policy, so to speak, still you have to pick the suboptimal arms at least logarithmically in time. And the prefactor of this logarithm is something which is connected to an information, information theoretic object, which is the kullback leibler divergence between two distributions. For Gaussians, the kullback leibler divergence becomes the delta square, the gap square divided by the variance. Okay, so you sort of can connect with this kind of arguments that I had above. Okay. So, of course, this deriving this formula is not very difficult, but it will require two hours by itself. Okay, uh, I, I can I will point you to, to a book which works and elaborates on this on bandits where you can find all the mathematical results if you're interested. But the basic thing is here that this is the quintessential bound when it comes to balancing exploration and exploitation. It tells you that you, you have to keep on visiting apparently bad options, okay? You cannot stop exploring, never. You should go on and on but at the smallest acceptable rate, okay, which is means that cumulatively you must be logarithmic. The cumulative number of times that you visit a bad option must be logarithmic. What does it mean for the epsilon reading? This means epsilon t goes like one over t. Because if you pick the bad action every time step with probability one over time, when you make the sum of all, over all these probabilities, this will be the expected number of times that you do the wrong thing. It will be logarithmic because the integral of one over t is the logarithm of t. And here you have to be careful about what you put here. So if you put exactly what, something with like one over T, you have to be careful because if your prefactor is too large, it's fine. But if it's too small, you may fail. All right, uh, I've been overflowing. So uh, very last message. Uh, you can do even better than this. You could do something uh, adaptive like uh, uh, your learning rate could be depending on the action like one over the number of visits that. Okay, so this is combines the idea of adaptive learning rate. Uh, sorry, adaptive exploration with the number of counts. Okay, so you can also adapt exploration 
also that the learning rate. And then there is a whole world of algorithms that we don't discuss, okay? Sorry, um, I think that's not the correct title. So the go-to reference for this is Bandit Algorithms by uh, Lattimore and Sikasvari, which opens up uh, the discussion to all current knowledge uh, up to, I don't know, maybe one year ago, two years ago, uh, about what we know about Bandit Algorithms from uh, that was make the viewpoint. Okay, I will post you a link to this uh, book uh, on the Slack channel. All right, so we're done for today. Uh, tomorrow we will see how to combine this idea, epsilon greedy, with temporal difference learning and other kinds of exploration in order to produce uh, good algorithms that find optimal solutions of. Uh, uh, the Bellman equation without knowing the model. Okay. Fine. So if there are no questions, I'll stop sharing and see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Bye. See you tomorrow.